Good morning. Good morning. God is good. And all the time. So the next time you watch a confirmation kid come up here and light these candles, you just just think, huh, wow, that actually takes some skill, you know, like we, and, and confirmation kids, next time you're walking down here with that fire, realize that we are entrusting you with a big responsibility and uh, it's harder than it looks. So anyway, uh, thanks, Karen. <laughs> All right, uh, so hopefully you saw a lot of the announcements already. Check Friday's email for for more information about events that are upcoming. Um, and then hopefully you saw the email from last Monday, um, one, an email I didn't want to write about Denise Ulazic stepping down as our youth director. Uh, we've really been so blessed, so blessed to have her as our youth director, um, but uh, her husband is retiring early and I guess they like each other, whatever. She wants to spend more time with him. So, uh, so, we're, so we're so thankful that they're able to do that, but it, um, it's a very sad thing for us. Um, so if you know anybody who is interested in a part-time job as a youth director and who would be great, uh, you know, let us know. We also need a team now, a search team, to, to find someone to, to do that job. So if you are so moved to be a part of that, we would love to have you. We, I think we have a temple talk next from Scott Heyman. Yes, from, uh, he, Scott serves on council and he is the liaison to the property team. And I think that's what he's gonna talk about here. who don't know me, uh, my name is Scott Heyman. My wife Linda and I, along with our children, Michael and Natalie, have been members here at St. Barnabas for more than 20 years. Um, like a lot of young families, when we joined, we joined the church after our children were born as we wanted them to be raised with a strong Christian values and St. Barnabas was a very open and welcoming church. So to us, the church is not just a place to come on Sundays or on Christmas or on Easter, but rather a place to build a new community of relationships and become involved. So over the years, our family has reaped the rewards that have come by getting involved in various aspects of the things we do here at St. Barnabas. Most recently, Linda has been council president and involved with the finance team, and I've been actively involved with the property team and I'm now also on church council. So I'm here to talk to you today about what we do in, in property. You know, I've always had a knack for fixing things. I'm a bit of a do-it-yourselfer. Most of this I learned from my dad um, as a young kid, and, but frankly, a lot of it has come just through trial and error and trying things. So I knew this was a talent that I could help offer to the church, so, I became a member of the property team some number of years ago. So after the salaries and payroll are paid here at the church, property is actually the church ministry that has the next largest budget. I regularly tell people that maintaining our church and its grounds is much like maintaining five houses. The property team is involved in all aspects of maintaining and updating the church property both inside and out. It's a big job. You know, our current property team members are Bob Kubis. A lot of you know Bob, he's the property chair. Myself, um, Bill Rochford and Bob Eckerd. So we're a team of four, um, always looking for new people to help. Throughout the course of the years, we have dozens of volunteers from the church, the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the youth, all that help us with various projects that we have underway and the help is always needed. Some of our recent projects that your property team has tackled and has been involved with include the recent painting of the sanctuary in our narthex a couple of years ago, the upgrade to the church bathrooms in the narthex area just last summer, and the installation of a new tankless water heater downstairs in the family life center. 
We also tackled and recently completed the renegotiation of a 10-year lease uh, with the Cary Food Pantry. And I think most of you have seen the full resurfacing and striping of our parking lot that happened last fall. And most recently, we helped coordinate the spring cleaning day here at church. So these are just a few examples of the things that the property team gets involved with um, at various times in the year. One of our current projects now is involved with the replacement of our electronic sign, you know, out on Cary Algonquin Road. If you've been to church recently, you've noticed that our old sign has been removed and we're now awaiting the delivery of the new sign, which is targeted for early June. Donations from both the food pantry and preschool have offset some of the cost of the sign, but the entire cost of the project will be close to $25,000, an unexpected, unbudgeted expense. But I'm thrilled to tell you that we're making great progress on getting additional dollars. We've worked with the stewardship team to kick off a special appeal for these donations, and it's called Sponsor a Pixel. So look for more information coming on that, but we've gotten great uh, response so far. We're getting closer. So if you've not yet joined our appeal for sponsoring a pixel for our new sign campaign, please help us uh, with a donation uh, to get our sign fully paid for. Uh, another project we're working on is this summer we're looking for volunteers to totally help us replace our winter nativity scene that we display each year outside the church. For years, we've used this display and being outside in the elements over time has just taken its toll on many of our wooden characters and they need to be replaced. So if you're handy with woodworking, know how to run a jigsaw, you know, we're, look, we're looking for people to help us pick up a character or two over the summer um, and use the... Um, uh, the new wood that the church will have in the garage to help us replace these characters. This is a great way for you to help the property team with a pretty large project that we have to undertake and we need to have that completed by November um, to display the new nativity characters you know, for hopefully many years to come. Lastly, as spring arrives, so does our weekly lawn mowing here at church. If you're not been involved at all with helping the property team, lawn mowing is a great way to help. Watch for an email or check the encourager for a link to sign up. Um, anyone on the property team can help you with training on the mowers. Um, we need volunteers all throughout the summer, and we never have enough mowing volunteers, so your help is sorely needed there. Uh, watch for the sign-up, um, and uh, please help us with signing up to be a mowing volunteer this summer. We're always looking for people to join the property team. Please reach out to any of us on any of the property team members that I mentioned earlier and let us know if you'd like to join. We'd be thrilled to have a few additional members to help us with the countless projects we do here at St. Barnabas. You know, each one of us has our unique and different talents for what we can offer and bring to the church. Maybe property is not a fit for you. Maybe it's fellowship, maybe it's Christian education or youth or stewardship. Whatever your talent, I'd encourage you to get more involved here volunteering at church and reap the benefits that we have over the years. Thanks to all of you who regularly volunteer with dozens of projects that we have around the church each year. We very much appreciate all the work and help that we get. Maintaining our church wouldn't be possible without the help of our volunteers. So thank you again for what you continue to do and we look forward to you helping us and volunteering more here this summer. All right, thanks Scott. Uh, they do a tremendous amount of work. I'm super thankful for the property team also because when the furnace for my part of the building goes out, and it's like 52 degrees in my office, they fix it. You know, they, they call the people who come and fix it. So I'm, I'm really thankful. I've seen, I know a lot of you here have mowed the lawn before, or I've seen you with a weed whacker out, out there as I pass by on a, on a Saturday morning. So thank you for those who, 
who are able to do that. It's always a big job. All right, so I think we have uh, one more. This is more in the announcement. Oh, yes. Alan Keeger, this song's especially for you. Sounds like it's a great day, and I miss you because we haven't seen you here at church, but hope to see you soon. Happy birthday to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear Alan. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Many more, Alan. Congratulations. Happy birthday to Alan Keeger, the man who remembers every visitor who's ever walked through the doors of this church and is one of our best greeters by far. Usually, I don't let people, like, I don't, I don't do that happy birthday thing unless you turn 90 because, you know, you got to have something, but it's COVID, so whatever, right? So anyway, happy birthday to Alan. I, I've noticed... I did notice when we were singing, maybe it's not time for us to start singing in the sanctuary. <laughs> we sound terrible, right? <laughs> All right, people, more car singing this week. Sing in your cars. All right, and then uh, here's one more final announcement. This is from the caring team. And, and this is about the stimulus uh, campaign that we have been running. Here's an update from our stimulus campaign. Thanks to Steve for the original idea. St. Barnabas has gotten $1,840 and our total with the other churches involved. is Let's see if we can add a little more by extending our deadline to April 30th. That, that is just mind-blowing to me, right? I know, we definitely a round of applause for this. Yeah. If you want to know more, there's the, the, the flyers uh, are out there. I was so excited about that, I decided I would double my giving. So um, anybody with me? Come on, come on, people, come on. So uh, I, uh, as I've said before, Lutheran Social Service is definitely near and dear to my heart. That's, uh, my husband was, I, was adopted through local Lutheran Social Services, so was Mark Gates. Uh, so two good reasons to give uh, to that part of it. Uh, but of course, working with domestic violence and homelessness is also, those are also two really important um, uh, services in this county. So um, anyway, kind of exciting. Okay, I think it's time to worship. Yes, all right. And so we begin with our thanksgiving for baptism, which really is our confession and forgiveness. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Refreshed by the resurrection life we share in Christ, let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Please take a moment for silent reflection. Let us pray. We thank you, risen Christ, for these waters where you make us new, leading us from death to life, from tears to joy. We bless you, risen Christ, that your spirit comes to us in the grace-filled waters of rebirth, like rains to our thirsting earth, like streams that revive our souls, like cups of cool water shared with strangers. Breathe your peace on your church when we hide in fear. Clothe us with your mercy and forgiveness. Send us companions on our journey as we share your life. Make us one, risen Christ. Cleanse our hearts. Shower us with life. To you be given all praise with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. 
Jesus, you are the fulfillment of the prophecies, and with scripture and water you claim people as your own. Claim us with water and the word, so that we may rejoice in the life given to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today's readings um, are Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 48. After his resurrection and before he ascended to heaven, Jesus explained to his followers how he had fulfilled the promises for a Messiah found in the Hebrew scriptures. Then Jesus said to the disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms may be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The next reading is Acts 8, verses 26 through 39. In Acts chapter 6, Philip was appointed as deacon in the early church to serve those in need. Apparently, the Holy Spirit had other ideas for him when he was sent to witness to an unlikely traveler, a powerful man from Africa. Like the disciples before him, this man wanted to understand who Jesus was and what the Hebrew scriptures said about him. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and he went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Cadence, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was, re was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went out down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. The word of the Lord. Please join me in a prayer as we center ourselves. God, this morning we come to you like the disciples came to Jesus and we ask that you would open our minds. Help us to understand. Help us as we show others the way too. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A son asked his father, Daddy, what's string theory? The dad replied, why are you asking me such difficult questions? Can't you ask me something easier? The son thought about it and asked, okay, so why does mommy get so mad at you sometimes? 
So the father answered, string theory is a theoretical framework. Okay, so apparently some people weren't super impressed with my sheep jokes from a couple weeks ago. What? I know, right? I can't believe that. So, <laughs> right? Bah. So I decided it was time to torture you again. You're welcome. Also, it turns out that it's not hard to find jokes about questions. There are a lot. And maybe that's because we all have so many questions ourselves. Today's reading from Acts 8 proves this. 25% of that passage is questions. Yes, I like added all the different sentences, 25%. And they're good questions. And if we're paying attention, the story itself should make us ask questions too. For example, my overarching question after reading this story is this. Can we, like Philip, let the Holy Spirit do the work that the Holy Spirit needs to get done? I'll talk about that more at the end, but keep that question in mind throughout the next several minutes. Can we, like Philip, let the Holy Spirit work the way the Holy Spirit needs to work? The Holy Spirit's work in this story began when an angel commanded Philip to station himself along a road in the middle of nowhere. Who knows how long the poor guy stood there before that chariot from Jerusalem finally came by. The Spirit acted again and told Philip to run alongside the chariot. Now, I find this image kind of amusing. Hopefully, Philip was in good enough shape that he could maintain a steady jog or maybe a brisk run. I mean, how fast are chariots? And what was the man in the chariot thinking? Was he so engrossed in reading his scroll that he didn't notice a random guy running alongside his chariot? Let's face it. Sometimes the spirit asks us to do weird stuff. But it's helpful to remember that if the Spirit asks us to do weird stuff, the Spirit will help us do that weird stuff. This brings us to the story's first question. Do you understand what you're reading? How many times have you wished someone would ask you that question. Do you understand? This high-ranking official from Ethiopia answered Philip's question with his own question. How can I unless someone guides me? Apparently Philip's question was the right question to get him a ride in that chariot where he then answered all the man's questions about Jesus, what the Old Testament had to say about him, who Jesus was, what he did. Philip's answers were so compelling, the man had to ask one final question, maybe the most important question. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Now, before we dwell, delve into that question, I have another. Who wants to talk about eunuchs? I know, I know. Is this the question you were hoping I would avoid? Or maybe, was this the question you were hoping we would discuss? I've been interested in the mechanics of bodies my whole life and have asked way too many questions. My mom says I asked one question very loudly in the ice cream parlor when I was in middle school. I just remember really wanting to know the answer to it. Mom, how do cows get pregnant? I mean, didn't you have questions like that too? And how was I supposed to get that 
question answered without the internet. Aren't parents lucky these days that we can just let our kids find answers on Google? I know, it's a little horrifying, isn't it? Yes. Anyway, that question, who wants to talk about Unix, is closely associated with a question I love asking the confirmation kids. What does circumcised mean? Who knew that topic came up in the Bible as often as it does? And who doesn't like to see middle schoolers react to that question? <laughs> Even with a mask on, you can see that they are reacting to that question. I know, Debbie's like covering her face. It's horrifying, right? Imagine Daniela in class that day, right? Now, luckily for you, we don't have to deal with circumcision this week because it comes up in the reading next week. I know, right? Who knew it came up in the Bible so often? I was so excited when I read ahead. And, and how was I that. supposed to get that I know, question answered without the next week? Whoa. Okay. All right. All right. All right. The computer is so excited about the topic next week that it's talking back to us. Anyway, back to Unix. Mm, so uncomfortable. The practice in some communities was for families to voluntarily allow a son to be castrated and then given a powerful position in a palace. The belief was that eunuchs were safe because they didn't pose a threat to the queen and that and then could be trusted with important kingdom business, such as all the money in the country. This is quite a trade-off. All that power for your body. Why is this important to understand? Why are we even talking about this? Because while this important man from Ethiopia had, given, had been given so much power, he had also been given some pretty high barriers in his life. How could he marry? How much shame and emptiness and pain must he have had to not be able to have children how did others look at him once they figured out who he was and what had happened to him? The story says he'd just been in Jerusalem worshiping, but Jewish law said that anyone who was castrated wasn't allowed to enter the temple. They weren't considered whole. Was all that power worth the exclusion he'd experienced throughout his life as a eunuch when it wasn't even his choice? So when he asked his final question, what is to prevent me from being baptized? He must have been thinking of all that had prevented him from belonging to the world his whole life. As much as he'd hoped to be marked as a child of God in baptism, surely there must have been something to prevent it. I'm quite sure that when he asked his question, 98% of him expected a long list of why he would be excluded yet again. What are the ways that you've been excluded from God's kingdom? What are the ways others have been excluded or we've tried to exclude others? While castration isn't such an issue these days, or at least I hope it's not, there are certainly lots of other ways we've worked to exclude people because of their bodies, their genders, their sexual orientations. I've been a pastor now for almost 17 years, but it could have been closer to 25 years if I hadn't had to work through being excluded from ministry because of my gender. 
What is to prevent me from being baptized? Nothing. There in the middle of the dry wilderness, water appeared out of nowhere. And the man was marked, not as broken or incomplete. The man was marked as God's beloved child. Can we, like Philip, let the Holy Spirit work the way the Holy Spirit needs to work? Back to that question. So here's the thing. The Holy Spirit will work despite us. But the outcome is better when we choose to do the work that the Holy Spirit calls us to do. Can we let go of what holds us back and run after chariots and plunge ourselves into water? Can we allow the Holy Spirit to snatch us away from one task and set us down in the middle of another? Can we ask our questions and trust that God will answer them eventually? And can we trust that God loves us more than we can imagine? I don't know how you'll answer that question, any of those questions, this week. But I know how God wants you to answer them. Amen. So Scott is singing a great hymn for this idea of everyone being included. Gather us in. Let us pray. Holy God, you have called us to follow in the way of your risen Son and to care for those who are our companions, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love. Seeking to be true friends of all, we offer our prayers on behalf of the church and the world. 
We pray for the church and its leaders, especially Pastor Sarah, that the Holy Spirit stir us to action and lead all people into deeper relationships with Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for creation as it wakes from winter slumber, that the new life of spring reflects the vibrant life of all creatures have in you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the nations and the leaders of the nations that greed and selfishness give way to compassion and care for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all on the journey of faith that whenever they are, wherever they are on the road, you might provide them with insight and inspiration. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all who suffer in mind, body, and spirit, especially Deb, David, Jean's family, Robert, the Hyde family, Dolly's family, John, the Voigt family, Julia, John, Zulika, Kent, Pastor Sarah, Charlie, Sandy, Pastor Kara, and Carol, that they may now know comfort and peace even in the midst of pain and anxiety. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Guide us in the path of discipleship, so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing for others, bringing the promise of the kingdom near by our words and deeds. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with those around you. Peace. And so as, as we get the gifts ready here on the altar, consider the gifts that you have given this week or will give this coming week, gifts of time, talent, and treasure, whatever those look like. And let us pray. God of love, you call us beloved children and welcome us to your table. Receive our lives and the gifts we offer. Abide with us and send us in service to a suffering world. For the sake of your beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now let us pray with confidence in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so if you're at home, I hope that you can uh, give and take communion as you are able, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Uh, The rest of us will take it on the way out. Grace to go. Receive now the final blessing. 
May our glorious God grant you a spirit of wisdom to know and to love the risen Lord Jesus. The God of life, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace. Share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.